Welcome back fellow armchair generals, this is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 8. Of course we're playing as Germany. Oh, that's too fast. No, up one. There we go. Okay, well. We'll see how this balances out here in a moment or two. Uh, those reinforcements. As you can see, we're doing all. Still doing a bunch of dust ICs, but we are working more and more and getting some other unit types through the process. We are doing well. What's that? A little under. About 40% of the ICs needed. Okay, Spain. What is Spain? Can you give them fuel for money? Certainly, Spain. You want some fuel? They still technically have a war going. Okay, now pilot training has advanced. Good. Somehow we went over that and I didn't notice, so we're going to stop that. Put fighter in 38. No, we're almost to 38, but... I'm so close, I want to get these going. And all. But we'll leave the nav pilot. I wonder how long Madrid will hold out. Ground fighter crew training has advanced, okay. And that we're going to switch over to here. And small warship sonar. Fairly important. And we're going to start that. As soon as we start placing all those units, all those air units, on the map, some ground of course, um, we're going to see a couple of effects happen. One, greater need for... Okay. Um, civilian supplies to counterbalance it. Not exactly sure how the math works, but that's my understanding of it. And um, likely... Maybe not in every every factor, because some of them, I think, are pegged in at certain levels. Um, it didn't last long. We will um, see a need to upgrade some of that stuff. Okay, let's see this. The U.S. We've got lots of money and need supplies. And intercept and tactics have advanced as well. Oh yes, okay. And air superiority, we're going to take both of those off.
think we've got. Well. That's just a day or so away. Well, a few more than that, but not by much. Ten days. These will be, of course, very helpful once we get into the Soviet Union situation. Trust me, I not literally nightmares, but I still have horrid memories of trying to take Moscow. Of stacks of shattered units getting stuck back into Moscow. Um, and then my armies around them with zero supplies. Maybe partially my fault by having... Um, large number of armies there, but well, that's just too big. But what we will do is another. Oh, well, not just yet. Um, but mostly just the horde supply situation. And it comes from multiple, but it was part of the problem, I think, was, um, again, I'm not good at um, the math, is just literally the supply tax of so moving the supplies, the cost to move the supplies. And I know it costs to move to move supplies, but this is why I'm, whenever it comes up, I push on the Hearts of Iron 4 um, Railroad, um, or Hearts of Iron 4 Forum about railroads, and... Um, there was some talk about various infrastructures and things. Uh, and infrastructure affecting the amount of resources uh, gained as a way to um, do the very real world, as a way to do the real world expansion of resources as the war went along because we've talked about it in Germany but in other places they may have known about deposits of um, res of needed resources and even actively um, mining or refining cause some of the stuff is refining is the bottleneck but actively mining or refining the resources but there were other additional cheaper resources around the world that could be bought it's once a lot of those were closed off that it became necessary to maximize the use and as you can, as um, if you played Hearts of Iron 4, you know, in Germany, need oil or rubber, just start building synthetic power, or, or um, synthetic plants. And um, there's normally a lag in that, but you can catch up to a lot of it and do that. And it works. Um, and it's historically possible. Um what they don't allow you to do is unlimitedly increase the amounts of things like um, tungsten or something. And that's reasonable, but it's also reasonable to expand it more than just the sort of 10% expansion that they do step through. So, again, I was pushing for railroads, and, and some of the other people talked about um, coastal shipping and um, canals. Or, or um rivers but um barge traffic on rivers that is being very important and still um cheaper and better to than railroads and it, very true of that i just don't know how to simulate coastal shipping um you know we're talking small boat stuff here or well maybe not small boats but coastal coastal you know shipping that you really can't do a lot of um, submarine attacks and it's hard to simulate um, you know other than to some degree is if you have a factory on a port or on a, you know on a coast it gets more um, 
um, benefit out of it as well as um, on some of the rivers so you can but I don't know how how they're gonna how they could do that but my my point was is that looking at Manchuria out here and some of the maps it's underdeveloped in particularly like the road network system um, and even if you look at the square size of Manchuria and then look at the same square area of Germany the amount of railroads it's incredibly underdeveloped even the railroads but what they did do was um, increase um, the railroads to the needed points so I was pushing for railroads and going back to um, do it on the provincial scale and not just big state scale or whatever and so of course the big state scale yeah um, you don't see it here but you know the Texas is one state in there and um, this is one state in Germany here so it's you know size scale it's screwy but railroads hauling the supplies out to Moscow because we sat outside of if you remember the series outside Moscow plenty long enough for the supplies to move one province at a time and get there and know that oh there is a huge stack of units out here that need supply so we have to you know start shipping out huge amounts of supply I think a lot of it was just eaten up on the supply tax so getting those things down um, is incredibly important and I think there are some events and I we did do some before but unfortunately because sort of they are railroad ish in that they are following particular lines that get improved but the supply in this game doesn't follow through the uh, most efficient route it's sort of the I don't know the most direct route or something um, so and even there I'm not sure that I'm not sure it's logic of its supplies but the idea that um, you would trace the supply along an efficient route and then I'd be happy to build you know the infrastructure up on a um, particular as I go along and even early days in advancing um, but I don't want to you know start building you know uh, sorry about this row by row by row by row, you know turn you know huge amounts of um, infra as you go along everywhere in every province that's just way too much and part of that would be um, the thought is with the railroads and supplies again I know I'm talking about a another game but I think it's sort of appropriate here is that if you have an effective railroad that zips up along here and you have one way down here unit you stack a huge number of units here halfway in between the two they would start because I'm presuming at the moment um, that there are very little infrastructure they would start starving because trying to get the the food the fuel the ammo whatever um, the supplies and the fuel to these units out here if you've stacked a huge number of units here um, would starve you know and least of the ability to have offensive capabilities they might not literally starve but depending on how many units of food but the idea that they couldn't go on offensive so this would change the nature of the battlefield and something that they don't seem to and a lot of people don't want to acknowledge is that um, to some degree the advances happen along certain paths because that's where the railroads are a lot of the, the developers and people look at Europe central western Europe that and I have some maps that I know I've shared um, times um, you know outside of a few rugged provinces in Switzerland and you know the German Alps and places like that and some of the more rugged parts of Spain most every one of these province has a rail link and maybe even some crisscrossing multiple through them but most of them have rail links to them so that you don't have that situation there so that if I were to um, stack a huge army here you just go around it right but 
and, and a slight army to either side. But once you get out here, or, and as some of them talking about, is the war in China. Once you get out into these places, if I stack the huge army on the rail line, and then, a, you know, thin lines out either way, you can't send your huge army and just smash through this and leave the railways um, supplies intact and push very deep in it because you're going to run out of supplies even though you smash through here because you don't have the supply chain you have to you know I don't know link back around the pincer movement to reconnect to the railways and where railways and then move forward it's that kind of thing it really 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 would affect um, how you would advance and um, you know, one or two divisions, yeah, you know, over most of the, you know, outside of the Pripyat marches, uh, marshes and, and things like that. You know, outside of a few cases, you could advance over most of this territory with a division or two and keep it supplied, but that's just a division or two. Eventually, when you're talking the large numbers of it, you've got to um, get control of the railway or that supply tax really would become an, an effective thing. And it would really matter. Trust me, it would really matter in um, combats for the Soviet Union. Is why Moscow is so important because of its central rail hub. And a lot of other things would just really make a lot of sense. Getting into the wilds, which, um, you know, all of this area here, and not just, you know, the big empty, but um, a lot of these other places in Africa where the rail lines go become incredibly important. And they just don't seem to want to acknowledge it. Uh, you know, both the developers and some of the players. Sort of one of my hobby horses that I get up and push on. And so that's, so I'm still thinking about what we're looking at for an east front campaign and making me worried yeah let's start steel I'm just a day or so off from that again I know I said that five days ago but we're getting closer sure Ireland you can have some supplies and I know you can say, and it would be legitimate, we're all playing the same game and we're all having the same issues, how to win while dealing with them. Um, yeah, that's very true. But I know I could design a really, really good World War II game on this level. Not that the parrot, because they've done a very good one in Hearts of Iron 3 with you know, Black Ice installed on top of it, but there we go. There's a bunch more th factories there. And I rearranged some of these or production orders. I just want to make sure, again... That I'm maxing out there because we're going to max that out. Wherever I have a force multiplier. Yes, yes, it may not be so necessary, but. Yeah, okay. Well, and just come down here, just a couple of them. Get them to the top. So, and not that, you know, Hearts of Iron 4 people couldn't, but they, they look at it, and I'm going just purely from what they've said publicly. I'm um, going to have a bunch of decisions here, so pause it. Um, is that they're trying to design a game that's set in World War II, if you will. Um, and that part of that element is 
to sell it to masses of people. Because I don't know if my I, my game, you guys would like the, the Hearts of Iron, the Black Ice players. But I don't know that the game I would design would have as big a mass appeal. I would like to think so. But um, it's just a, um, you know, mine would be a little bit, a little bit more technical, I'm sure, than what they're doing. But now nah, I couldn't program. See, I don't have those skills. Okay, so this has gone down. I'm still not exactly sure. What all that? I, it's something to keep the people from going super early into warfare. I'm sure, but um, the biggest problem here is is that I need to. Okay. So I think we I think we missed a complete um, big national upgrade because of the lack of steel so for trade agreement we're gonna buy American steel pretend we're in Japan okay um although it's no longer all that good I'm just might as well do it Economic spying. Economic boost. Hopefully we'll get it. Long-term investment. Annual national focus. Again, it's going to be economics here. Um, because we're not going to war. We're doing enough research and all of that. I think at least. And as you can see here now, massive amounts, but also to see all those heavy industry um, capacities in Dusseldorf, Berlin, Konigsberg, and Frankfurt on oh, man. And man. Two Frankfurts, I know. Two different rivers. Um, so, and Brandenburg Commando Unit. Very hard to find. Very, very hard to find. Um, uh, photos of the units. And I've looked through books. Yes, we will get this. Now this is becoming a super powerhouse for... Okay, we're getting even more steel there, 37. High popularity, good. We're going to stall that out. Now it's upgrading. Ludendorff's funeral. Of course you, um, I'm sure most of you at least, um, know of Eric Ludendorff, he was one of the, I guess, field marshals, um, sort of the number two to Hindenburg, um, that really sort of did the last big, sort of somewhat useful offensive in the West, um, in World War I, obviously didn't win the war, they lost the war, even though they, they tried that, um, Ludendorff, is sort of Bavarian focused. He was involved in the beer hall um, putsch that Hitler tried, though he was. There's some controversy over just his role and some of the different roles, but he quickly distances himself from Hitler. But he continues, unlike Hindenburg, um, who obviously becomes president um, and is a conservative, somewhat right winger. I say somewhat is in compared to some of these other groups. He, Ludendorff, has become an, a rabid right winger, um, similar to but different than the Nazis. So he he has his funeral, or he dies, and Hitler is he marching there, and big sort of funeral that really plays it up. And Hitler is trying to, you know, 
use the legacy in his benefit. So um, Ludendorff was still a possibility of some minister or something, which he disappears from that. National recruiting policy. We are going to do the, again, balanced approach. And since we've gone to high popularity, we have more leadership. We are fully 38. Austrian economic miracle. Sure, the Austrian economic miracle has happened to us. How interesting. Okay. Um, plus 5% ICs, plus 10% um, supplies and research efficiency. Now, I'm guessing that is a, you know, strategic effect. I'm not familiar with that. Land power, national highways. So like I did say, we did not get one of those, but we are one of these um, uh, massive improvements. We did get this for the um, doing the um, national highway program under TOTE from TRE. Okay, Austrian economic miracle. Um, okay, I don't know why we're getting this. Um, quite honestly, I don't. I, either from historical or um, game reasons. I didn't know of an Austrian economic miracle. We need all that extra steel. Okay, the Reich Ver Waltung Ordungs NSDAP. I hope you Germans find my um, accent amusing. Um, obviously, well, I got the photos for the book um, from my um, current copy of it. Obviously, it didn't look that tattered back then. Um, the Reich administration administrative procedures of the NSDAP. It was written or edited or whatever by Franz Xavier Schwartz. Um, he does have, he is a minister type. Um, he is one of the major NSDAP um, leaders functions um, and just part of the again um, heavy organizational um, elements of the NSDAP and organizing Germany. So we're publishing the book, we're gain, the party's gaining more popular or more organiz, organization, a little bit of popularity, less than one. That's why it's just a zero there. But it's like, I don't know, 0.25 or 0.5. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Um, and we lose a little bit of supplies in printing all of the book and books, papers, forms, whatever, it's a sort of representative of that. Okay, establish the... Okay, this is um, part two of the earlier event. This, we asked if we wanted to establish it, and we said yes. And so this is um, the benefits of having the school. A few more officers gain a little manpower back after you built the school. Though I think it may have cost us five, or I'm not sure. Um, and then you gain some um, uh, progress on different doctrines. And then also the Wunderseeboat Schule Flotilla. Um, let's 
Is that it? Or did it go into the product? I just I don't know whether it's Yeah, that I think zip because it's not attached. That this is the expansion of it, just that I think is all that we get. So and it's yeah, moved over to here. So we'll rebase that and yes, just um few more subs with the expansion that we paid earlier for that. Okay, this was another interesting thing. Um, Obviously, in the in these days, um, there was a lot of you know first flight type records um, going around. Um, the most famous is Lindbergh across the Atlantic, and not just across the Atlantic, he, but he goes from you know um, mainland USA to Paris, not like to Ireland or just barely get there. He goes all the way to Paris. Which shows, obviously, you know, he's the first one to do it alone. I mean, we had been seeing other stuff, but, um, but get across that, which shows that it is commercially viable for, for air transport, even in this day and age on a commercial thing, you know, commercial basis ongoing. Um, but this was an interesting article I found, um, did a little more research, um, we can make the flight or not. Um, we'll gain a little bit of popularity. Cost us a little bit. Just um, do that. And as you can see from the map here, starts up in Germany, goes to, you know, across to Italy. Um, and these are the stops. So this is like one long flight from um, Libya there all the way to um there, um, what is it, Brindy, um, to Benga, uh, Goya, there, um, and then down through Indonesia, you know, and all the way down to Australia with an, um, Arado AR-79, um, so just pushing that off, and we get the development of doing this long-range, um, research and you know I'm sure and I just haven't looked into it and well I've I do have a few other things some French flights into places in Africa and things like that that aren't in the um, you know mod of course maybe we're giving too much bonuses to Germany on some of the stuff but I do look at that and not necessarily just that one event but like we're struggling to keep up um, steel is that there's a lot of costs involved in these things and I do really think that the leadership general idea um, Again, I'm not sure how much diplomacy and espionage and even frontline officers um, really add or take away from um, research. I do sort of believe I could separate all three of those things, all four of those, because I don't know whether you want to put espionage and diplomacy in one thing. That may be. But... Um, separate them all out and instead of just the generic slots that in a hearts of iron 4 you have which does sort of simulate it but um and you can look at the many more slots that black ice adds but they're all setting a lot of technologies is to have a um a function sort of like this does in that um Separate it, yes, but have um, a similar function to how many officers you have, 
how many um, research points you have and things like that that are spread around the map and um, you um, as you get more of them it can increase your um, ability to research because right now in Hearts of Iron 4 generally speaking um, you don't get more as you expand your territory out and you may think that you know this is a short-term game um, not like EU 4 or something um, but a lot of research and development and weapon systems continued done by checks um, I don't on each individual case don't know why they continued they developed and showed earlier want a link to it go back and look at it um, one of the best artillery weapon um, our artillery pieces were designed by a Czech arsenal basically late 40 very late 44 early 45 never put into production as the prototype and it was a type that um, sort of like the later Russian d30 in which now the Czech had four sort of legs the d30 had three in that when you deploy it, um, the tires come off the ground and you deploy these, you know, sort of cross section four legs that lay flat on the ground and um, which much better deals with the recoil than trying to have, you know, pneumatic tires absorb the recoil of artillery um, type thing. So, you know, that this is above and beyond of simply um, manufacturing something ordered by your um, superiors or your occupiers or your whatever. Um, you're creating new new um, weapon systems and the Czechs did that throughout the war um, to one degree or another you can look at the various developments on the 38 T's that yes the Germans were overseeing it but to some degree there was Czech involvement I don't know whether those were German Czechs that were cooperating or whether those were um, fascist and Nazi type Czechs or you know that ideologically agreed with the Germans or just simply checks that hey, this is my job I want to keep my job I want to keep getting my ration coupons I don't want to be put into a concentration camp so I will reluctantly continue to work and not just drag your feet but actually work and produce things for you know the occupiers um, we know that this happened in other countries as well just Czechoslovakia is the biggest example of it um, and we can also see that to some degree in the Soviet Union um, similar sorts of things I would consider some of it was a bit longer term you know uh, I look at the occupation of the Ukraine during the during the Stalinistic era as a foreign occupation during the whole thing and they were drawing Ukrainian leadership out of it and I do know that there was some some elements of um, weapon design more production though coming out of Poland um, at this time now um, Dudone Salve um, an apprentice of John Browning um, of Liège and the FN um, factory here he um, was the sort of final designer of the Browning high power the Browning high power had already been designed by by Browning he designed the the double stack magazine to a single feed position and fatten the handle so it was sort of in the 1935 after Browning had died he designed sort of the, the the magazine part of it and matched it up to the to the Browning really final best locking system that Browning designed so he had his fingers in that but then he later goes on and takes um, other Browning work um, and creates the FN FAL and some other small arms that Belgium done and really good he escapes and goes to Canada and um, wherever Inglis is in Canada the English Inglis factory there and um, recreates the Browning high power though the Inglis high power um, as it was called parts are, are not swappable you have to re, re, re mill them, re, re change them because um, he didn't have access to the original design specs. So he knew what it was and there, there are some changes in it, but um, it just, the 
the dimensions just don't quite fit, just don't aren't quite right between the two guns. So um, sets up the pistol manufacturing there, and I presume also has a little bit to do with setting up, um, though I don't know, the Bren gun production in Inglis. Those are the two main weapons that Inglis built in Canada for the war. Um, but he escapes. But a lot of the other um, Browning workers don't, and they continue to work. Though Germany really doesn't take advantage of their leadership to, or whatever you want to call it, um, research to develop new weapons in Liège, but does get a hold of their current stuff. So there is a fair amount of that, but what you can do is look at various occupational policies that um, radically reduce the effect. So, you know, um, whatever leadership for research or research points or whatever Paris would have for France, Germany gets like, I don't know, 10% of them or something, you know, where France would have 100% of them. Um, so, you know, you just do that. So it's realistic to a degree, um, but it's not, you know, capture all of France, get all of France's leadership equally, you know, that kind of thing. So I know I talked a little bit long about that, but I really think that that... is a good system to have and would like to see that back okay cancel cancel okay we want to improve our armored cars but they're not a high priority um let's get radar researching now See, I think a lot of things, and this is sort of coming off of what I was posting earlier on this day that I'm making a recording. Um, can we trade with the U.S. again yet? Oh, yes, good. Okay, we want to, now we're buying a lot of, we want to sell now a lot of supplies. Um, The designers of Hearts of Iron Force seem to, and again I say a lot of this because I don't want to make you think I know this, seem to have come up with a lot of really great ideas, but didn't have the resources to excuse me, implement them well. A little bit of hiccups. Um, so that um, we were talking a little bit on the on the Hoi 4 forum um, about air aces, and a lot of them are... Um, auto-generated sort of randomly well there are for every nation that has a significant time in the war there are plenty of aces you know obviously i don't you know belgium i don't know if they even shot down an aircraft but um you know in air-to-air -air combat but they weren't around long enough really to generate any significant number of aces so we could postulate a um a scenario in which Belgium is around a long time and doesn't have a lot of historical air aces. Or, um, obviously, Sweden didn't go to war, so unless you're looking at Swedish pilots serving in other, other air forces, like a bunch did serve in Finland, um, you're not going to find Swedish air aces if Sweden goes to war. But for all the real major participants, there's plenty of aces out there to, to have an, an, a fighter ace generation system that generates real people. But because they didn't have the resources to research or to make all of the color images that they like to do, the sort of painting style, um, uh, drawn style, whatever you want to call it, um, of the color images, they couldn't, they didn't implement that well. And I was sort of um, stating that the Ares type thing is just a... Um, a way to get around the inability to make enough photo Im or enough images for all the um, squadron commanders because you know so they wanted to do a lot with hearts of iron 4 but they just did not put the 
you know, resources into into doing that, and they sort of overpromised, in my opinion, on a lot of that. Okay, damage controls. What for what things? Um, light ships of some sort. Damage control systems. Yes, we will stop that. And the other one is ground attack. Tactics advance. Okay, now. We're going to do... We're going to get radios improving here. We're going to get decryption improving. And that looks like it takes up all of our stuff. And also, along with um, the ideas of increasing leadership, say, by conquest, increase it like we do here, um, sometimes with a, you know, just events that we're opening up new schools, but also you could do various effects on um, you know, decision-making that you know, overall just increase leadership by, oh, yay, we got some blueprints stolen. We want to have this pause the game normally. Because it's cool when the rare times we get it. Okay, um, our spies have stolen plans to let us improve our abilities in heavy bomber pilot training to level two. Okay, well, just up one. Sometimes I really, when, because um, of various bonuses and things, um, sometimes you get here just up from level one to level two, but you know you'll you'll jump two or three levels. Because you'll steal their latest tech, and so you do it. It's not obviously we're not putting much into spies. Okay, um, I found this to be interesting, and this is part of um, interaction between Germany and um, Yugoslavia. But this was um, uh, a menu that someone uh, I found online that someone was um, selling that um, well. No, I don't know menu, but oh, well, maybe menu and um, sort of program for one of these state dinners that um, someone had a bunch of the notaries that were attending it signed from different governments and places. Um, but it's um, uh, Milan, I could butcher his name, but which is this guy here from Yugoslavia coming up meeting with um, uh, Van North, Van, Van Roth. The north, north, ah, butchering that too. Okay, so this is a part of Germany sweet talking Yugoslavia into its sphere, so it helps us just a little bit. I just thought that was an interesting piece of history that shows leftover from the period. Okay. We can now get the Anschluss of Austria now. Let's pause this. I don't think there's any reason to not do this now. Um, as you can see, we at peace. Um, basically, we got where well, we have reoccupation of the Rhineland here. The crisis in Austria. So we're going to take it. This will um, disrupt relations with everybody, including Italy. Mussolini, by this time, was more or less on board with it, but was still a bit worried. Um, with this. And on Slush or not. I guess this is a way we can leave them for now. No, we're going to take this. Okay. Inherit Austria. Keep the manpower gain. I want to inherit the units. They may not be the greatest units, but um, yeah. And um, Italy. Now, when did 
Italy joined the Axis. When they signed the Pact of Steel, when they joined the anti turn Pact, um, when they uh, signed the Tripartite Pact, you know, just when did they join the Axis? Um, now, obviously, um, you know, that's something up to, you know, game designers kind of thing. But January 38th. Yeah, I can see that as that. And of course, Pact. So now we have the Pact of Steel efficiency. Again, the Pact of Steel was signed a lot long before this, but signing a pact and calling cool, calling it a cool name. When they signed the Pact of Steel, and this is something I've done a lot more research on and shown up. Um, Italy was also a member at the same time that he signed the Pact of Steel was also a member of the Three Powers Pact. And the Three Powers was Italy, Austria, and Hungary. And to some degree it was an anti-German pact. Uh, two of them had been um, losers in World War I. Obviously Italy was the winner. But now is at the time that that's happening is becoming a bit of an international pariah over um, Ethiopia. But it was a, but it was not an anti-British um, or French pact, the three powers. It was an anti-German pact to make sure that Germany didn't gobble up these other countries, which we just now gobbled up Austria. So the Pact of Steel, we now get increased supplies, which, rec my opinion, recognizes increased trade and research efficiency, which they didn't do as much as they could have or should have, but. Um, they did do some um, going on, and so we're sort of, but it's only 2.5%, two two so it helps. It may be slightly overstated, but they did do share some. Okay. Um, yes, I'm, I made this event, and yes, I'm making you um, build the building here. Um, the Rice Chancellery costing you a lot until that um, February 6% there because Hitler wants it and you wouldn't build it if I gave you the, the choice probably. And obviously there's a bit more about it. Speer is doing that. The Treaty of Munich. Hmm. We're going to hold off on that for just a little bit. You got to think about this here. Um, That wasn't that big of a hit for um, disruption, so it's coming very fast. Oh, production here. Okay, that's why it's, it's coming down very fast. We've increased production a lot. Because we're now at... Ah, wow. Let's look at still war economy, which we don't want to do yet. I research. Yeah, I know tank radius and such are there, but we will do that beforehand. And yes, supplies are out because we just grabbed this order of battle here.
I thought the Austrian army was bigger than this, but I'm not sure. So this is obviously... Well, I'm thinking this is uh, maybe the reorganized element of that. Is closer at the moment. Let's look at rank, see who we have it ranked right. Alder will get a promotion. So, okay, what? Well, I'm not going to go in and, and alter anything right now, because if I go in and, and um, alter some of the files, it may cause things not to work ever again for this thing, this series. And yes, this series may actually get me to make some more Third Reich events for Hearts of Iron 3. Um, see some of these metal these um, because I know that I had and I don't know they've changed it somehow or something I know that I had some other checks originally done. Um, I'm pretty sure I did. I'm trying to remember just for the SDP and doing this. So I'm not. I'm not going to push it before historical. I don't know what's gone wrong there. Um, uh oh. No. Okay, the second international winter sports watch. See all the nations participating. Get a little bonus by that. Sure. Cost us some supplies. I've noticed very few of these going red right recently so I don't know what effects we are using or not using in the game um, that's not causing things to go bad which is good so this is still going to happen in late 38 but I'm just going to keep skipping it. Yes. Italy. You know, sure, you can have fuel. No, oh, Romania is wanting to join up. Okay. And yes, which keeps meaning I'm going to keep hovering over that often just to make sure no other decisions have popped up. Okay, destroyer escort roll. Well, let's do the usual thing and 
move away from the Navy. Assume those upgrading are various Austrian units getting upgraded. Well, that's not much of a change one way or another. No, oh, thank you. Oh, well, now we're in positive territory, money wise. Yes. Finland, we'll do that with you, Finland. Okay, the. Blomberg Fritsch affair. And I've come to understand this even better from um, my previous understanding of why and what happened. Um, basically, the, um, the way I understand... I don't understand the old Kaiserreich. Well, I just don't know it. So, um, and I have a book on the German general staff that does cover the period, but I haven't read that part of it. Um, I've sometimes bought batches of books at times that were used in sales, so I um, increased my collection, but I never got the chance to read everything. Um, but the way it was set up largely under the Weimar um, Republic was that the, um, the German army or the German armed forces, because it also included the Navy when it had one, an Air Force, but um, was not subject to the civil government of Germany. I'm not exactly sure, but I think generally speaking, um, it did come under the authority of the president when it was Hindenburg, and I'm not sure about some of the earlier times but and de definitely I know the the Kaiser was the military leader of of Germany but it was sort of this separate set aside um, situation and so as um, this is again generally speaking and from what I've read and I have not gone into a lot of detail but when you might say in a lot of modern governments um, whatever, I'm not talking like extreme right or extreme left, but, you know, when you go to, I don't know, the shall we call them the conservatives to the socialists or whatever in Europe, um, a new government comes into power, and um, if it had been a socialist um, secretary of defense, he leaves, and they bring in a conservative secretary of defense, and that switches around as um, people win and lose elections. My understanding has come is that the um, uh, with Germany, sort of the ministry, um, the German armed forces was um, run, you know, by by Bloomberg as a sort of minister, sort of apart from the rest of the government, and the army under the Weimar. Republic was, of course, technically limited at 100,000, but it was also a professional army. All of the officers, all of the soldiers, they were all volunteers, and they were all theoretically, um, though this is not the absolute case, obviously, but theoretically um, long-term service personnel. I do know that there was, um, to some degree, a scheme of trying to get train men through the army, you know, volunteers, and then get them out to sort of make up a reserve that they could call up in time of war. But it was um, a professional um, situation. And Hitler feared this um, situation. Under Hindenburg, he feared it because Hindenburg um, had sole control of the army, even though he was chancellor. So this is, he did not get to, um, obviously the first, um, set up a chancellor, he was a coalition government. Um, von Poppen was vice chancellor, and so on. And it was, you know, um, it wasn't, um, it actually it was a minority within the government post, a minority of Nazi um, leadership. 
but um, Hitler did not have the ability to change and swap that out. Now, Hindenburg dies. Um, the chancellor, Hitler, abolishes the position of sort of president or, or chancellor or whatever, or combines them or whatever. I'm not exactly sure of that um, in detail, but combines the one and calls it Fuhrer and makes it him. And, of course, there is that sort of big um, people talk about and I think over-talked about that all the German officers swore an oath to Hitler personally, not just to the office of the president or the, you know, the chancellor or the Führer, but to Hitler personally, blah, 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 is why the German army stayed loyal up until the end. I think that's overstated. I think that is an excuse um, significantly by post-war apologist for the German army going along with wars of aggression and trying to make it out. My grandpa was just doing his duty as either a private, well, privates obviously are drafted at some point, but as a sergeant or as a captain or as a general. And so, and he personally did not commit any war crimes, so he's not responsible for the war crimes. I think there's a lot of that German guilt going around and, um, the more I've looked at it is the more bullshit I, I've come to, to see that as it's, um, they went along with it. They just flat out went along with it. Now, like I say, Hitler feared the army once he, um, he significantly, and I don't want to say stop though. Some of the authors or one author sort of said stop during it, but significantly reduced his fear of the army once he got conscription back going because once you have subscription going he knew that the army is no longer this sort of professional military corps um, unit trained and organized and um, loyal to its leadership you now have um, mass um, not volunteers, but mass conscription, mass people from the masses are in there, not just people who want to be professional soldiers, even for, even for a four year time. It's once you're starting to get everybody in it. And so this also is, which is the German people. And he's sort of relying on the support of the German people, but also and we've looked at it um, to some degree, a lot of SA members, a lot of Nazis get drafted into the army. Now we also know this, that there were, um, uh, a lot of officers, including high-ranking ones, that were particularly Nazis um, going along. There were those two. And then, of course, there were a lot of right-wingers that were, you know, afraid of the Soviet Union. There had been the, um, the Spartacus Revolt in Berlin just after World War I, and were afraid of a communist takeover. And so Hitler looked like, you know, especially early on, looked like a an acceptable solution that would in time sort of go away kind of thing to the to these officers so um you've got the um the mass coming into the into the army and so hitler no longer feared the idea of a and it became less and less and i don't I, it wasn't um uh because i think that was in 35 um it was no longer going from fear of the army to not fear the army, but it no longer became this um, thing that was likely to loyally um, go by and do a putsch against um, Hitler's government. Um, just because Hitler believed, rightly or wrongly, I'm not sure, that a lot of the, um, the mass of German people that are conscripted briefly into the army um, – during the, the I'm talking during the years of peace here, um, wouldn't go along with um, fighting the SA and um, you know f having a brief civil war with the Nazis. But Hitler also recognized that the war ministry and um, the army weren't necessarily um, under his control either. There is um, and, well, as time goes on and as the SA and other things infiltrate more and more of the army, he, he fears it as an instrument less and less. Um, but the leadership of it was still very consequential. 
And we've talked about the Hossback uh, memorandum earlier, which is sort of Hitler putting out his plans of conquest. And there is serious doubt as to whether the army will go along with it. Bloomberg um, was a, to the best of my understanding, he was not a Nazi, but he was generally a supporter of what Hitler was doing. And I sort of want to do it that way and not say a supporter of Hitler. Because I don't think he blindly, loyally supported Hitler. I think he liked a lot of what Hitler was doing domestically, internationally, um, doing to help rebuild the German armed forces. He liked a lot of the, these things. He liked um, good order in German society. He liked the idea that most Germans now had a better um, living standard, had better, um, you know, weren't being oppressed because most Germans weren't being oppressed. It was the communists were being oppressed. The radical left-wing socialist um, trade unions were being um oppressed. I wanted to sort of say it that way because obviously there were Nazi trade unions and other ones. And over time, of course, all the trade unions come under the DAF, um, Deutsches Arbeiters Front, the German Workers Front. But so he doesn't see this as Hitler as being overly oppressive to normal, acceptable Germans. So he sees all this as going as, as a good thing. You see, like I say, rearming of Germany, um, territorial expansion to shall we say get back lost german territories he's in favor of is my understanding with bloomberg now, that doesn't mean he wants to go to war with france but if it's just going to be a war with um you know germany and poland sure and not not to like conquer at least is my understanding and now i've not read a detailed biography of him or anything but he wasn't bloomberg wasn't to the best of my understanding want to do a great crusade in the east and conquer the Soviet Union and, and turn it into German satraps or something going east. And But he wasn't adverse to going to war to Poland with Poland to get back German territory lost to Poland. I don't know that he would have been entirely upset with taking a larger chunk of Poland, but it was, like I said, it wasn't his goal to move further east. And he had a lot of power, Bloomberg did. And Hitler's realizing all of this. Um... And so even though Bloomberg is a um, supporter of what is going on with Hitler, he Hitler realizes that Bloomberg is not um, a Nazi supporter. There is a distinction. And I will draw this now, and I know that there's people on many spec political spectrums, um, with our current Trump administration. Trump wants Trump supporters in government, in the appointed... Now, I'm not talking about every level of the government office I'm talking about in his appointment. Part of the problem, like in the State Department, there's a bunch of unfilled appointment jobs, ones that, that um, serve purely to ple um, pleasure of the president. And definitely, as every time you change political party, these they always get swept out and there's always new ones. So nothing is different about that. These are the normal back and forth um, of political parties. Trump has had a very hard time getting these positions filled, and I think it's for two reasons. One, the Democrats in the Senate have been slow walking these, and very much so, whenever they can. Not that they're denying it, not that they're they're just making sure that every dot, every T is crossed. Oh well, it's going to take us a week to get through hearings, and but we got to do these other hearings first. And so since it's the same committee, they're just delay, they're just doing all the delaying tactics instead of just rubber stamping them because most of the people that that um, not all. But most of the people that Trump are, are um, appointing to these positions are reasonable choices. Um, a few have had a few of the high level, high profile ones have had to, to back out because of certain things. But that happens in every administration. It happened under Obama. It happened under Bush. It happened under Clinton. A few always have find a skeleton or two in their closet that just enough that they just decide whether it's the president decides or the individual decides or they both decide we're not we're going to back out for this one thing. so that's normal but trump has also and his administration really um said no to a bunch of republicans and conservatives because they're not always the same thing in the american politic that were either that were quote-unquote part of the never trumpers during the primary if you weren't if you came out and said significantly bad things about Trump during the primary, 
um, and often in supporting in the primary um, Trump's opponents in the Republican primary, um, he doesn't want you in his government. You are you are on the 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 do not hire list, and there are there are those, and um, a lot of like the State Department um, people and all these other these are sort of center of the line Republican functionaries that supported other Republican candidates. And the normal thing is, and you don't you don't get all of them, but just normally you negotiate with these people and they, they normally come on board. A lot of them, of course, thought Trump would never win, so either the primary or never win the general election, so they didn't think their, their opposition of Trump at that point was going to keep them from jobs. So a lot of them said things, supported people that said things that have got them on another never Trump list. So, like, I will say this. I, generally speaking, support a lot of what Trump is doing, but I am not a Trump loyalist, okay? So, um... I think some of, I think a lot of his, you know, tweets and other stuff are idiotic statements, you know, trust me, you know, and it just, part of it is, is putting it in a, you know, in a tweet, but, um, you know, that it just shortened whatever, and he's talking shorthand, but it's, you know, even when it's not that, some of his other stuff that he says and does, I don't like, um, I'm the type of person, not that I'm anywhere near the level for an appointment, but I'm the type of person that Trump would, would be on that don't put on there because I'm not a Trump supporter, but I will support him when I think he's right. And so far, what the general government's actions have been doing, I'm not talking about Trump's statements about this or that, either either in a speech or in a, a tweet. I'm talking about the general government's actions under Trump, I generally support. Um, you know, so uh, I may agree with you, whoever, and this is turning out to be a long episode, sorry about that, but, um, you know, particular policy is the policy that we're following in Syria correct god i don't know i have opinions on it but i because i don't have the full information and i don't even know the consequences of the things that i think are good are going to have in the long road but you know generally speaking i'm supporting trump's actions because generally you know the government's actions under trump because generally i think they're good um but i'm not a trump supporter i guess you know that's sort of what a lot of these people that so Trump wants loyalists. Um, Trump was within his rights to get rid of Comey, whether and he thought he thought the Democrats were going to like it because Democrats Democrats are going to um, attack anything that they think is that Trump wants to do, and tr they thought Trump wanted to keep Comey there, so they were attacking Comey. So as soon as he fires Comey, they're attacking him for firing Comey. It's complete double standard, complete bullshit. Complete that whole thing is, is just BS that they're going after Trump for firing Comey. It's just politic games, period, flat out. That's all it is. And Trump, the reason I believe, I don't know, not in his head, but the reason I think he fired Comey was is Comey had told him, and we now have it on record, at least three times that you're not under investigation, but Comey would not come out and publicly say that. All he wanted to do was, is what you told me in private, just go out to a lecture and say, currently at this time there are no, there is no um, investigations of Trump personally. We are investigating any other possible contacts within there, and if this changes in the future, we will let you know. And he could even have said that, you know, which they normally don't do that, but just say we're not investigating the president for Russian collusion personally. If he would have said that, Comey would still be head of the FBI. But he wouldn't come out and say that. And it was a true fact. It wasn't a what Trump wanted to hear. It was what he was telling Trump and what, to the best of our understanding and what, he's test what Comey's testified in, in front of Congress, was that Trump himself was not under investigation. They were investigating people around Trump. That may change, but at the, at the time that Comey was still in office, they weren't doing that. So, and because, and part of the thing is, was no one had made, there was no, either no evidence that showed that Trump himself was colluding with the Russians, and there was no credible, that the FBI thought, um, credible accusation that Trump himself was colluding with the Russians. Period. That's why they weren't investigating him. Evidence may change. I'm not saying it did or didn't happen, but that's what Comey was saying. That's modern politics, and that's sort of Trump's personality and a similarity and just a minor similarity that Hitler has. Hitler wants personal loyalists. Trump wants personal loyalists. Hey, 
you can be 100% anti-Hitler and want personal loyalists. It's no sort of equivalency in that sense, you know. So, this is Bloomberg's problem. Bloomberg is not a Hitler loyalist. Hitler wants to do his, wants to, at some point wants to defeat Britain. I don't think he ever wants to um, own Britain. Now, that could have changed if the defeat meant German panzers entering London, but I think he thought he could defeat combined armies on the um, mainland of Europe and bomb and submarine convoy, and Britain would come to the peace talks, you know, maybe trade colonial territories in places, but otherwise Britain would be unoccupied. That's you know, but he wanted his war to sort of revenge or sh or whatever World War One with the Western Allies. Where what would have exactly ended up with territorial swaps in France? Not sure. And realize, yeah. So, but he definitely wanted his Crusades, and I'd say Crusades because of multiple over years against Eastern powers. Whether that includes that includes Poland, that includes Russia or Soviet Union at the time. Um. So he wanted to move east. I don't. I think he worried that um, Bloomberg was not going to go along with that plan, and Hitler maybe. And again, you know, this is now thirty-eight. We've had more and more conscription going on. Um, still, the SA is still very large. On a day-to-day -day basis, the SA is unarmed, but they do have access to light weapons, generally rifles, that kind of thing. Um, but definitely don't have general access to artillery, to because all the all the training stuff that I I've ever seen. I don't acquire it myself. I you know get photographs of of manuals and things, but of all of the stuff I've trained, I've acquired, um, is all um, light. Um, weapons training tactics stuff similar to what they were doing with the Hitler youth they weren't training with artillery they weren't training with tanks they weren't training you know while well, the NSFK was doing pilot training but no fighter training you know so the the, the National Socialist you now that we can talk about like I said I think the Luftwaffe was a National Socialist organization but all the other more political wings are not training with heavy equipment so that you know you can hold your city with, you know, some thousands, tens of thousands of SA men, especially if the, the, the German army is not prepared to randomly shell, you know, artillery shell cities into submission. You can hold cities um, against an army, um, especially if you're very concerned about the population there. You know, so it's counterbalance and you're no longer looking at a civil war, but you can look at massive obstruction. Um, two wars, um, and that's what Hitler feared about Bloomberg. And so, um, the heir to Bloomberg that was very apparent was um, Fritsch. So, and I, what they did is, and this was a um, a planned organ, a uh, planned um, coup d'état against the leadership of the army. And that's it, it's purely simply a planned coup d'état. Um, Bloomberg um, falls in love with and marries a young woman, um, his young bride. Um, had posed for pornographic photos, as it says there, um, and supposedly at some point the photographer is determined to be Jewish. Um, I don't know, well, what is pornographic? Were they just nude, nude photo studies or were they full on pornography? I don't know. Um, I don't think any of them have survived and I don't think any accurate description of what the, um, actual photos were described, but it was some years before, um, now she's no longer like an 18 year old at this time, but, um, and I don't know her age right off, but she's much younger than, than she was but this is back in the um sort of rough days basically of my understanding the rough days of the weimar republic in which you don't have good um unemployment or social security benefits or whatever for 
for people without um, jobs and you have very high unemployment. So people get jobs um, where and when they can. Um, and also sort of, I guess the presumption is that the photographer was likely having sex with his models, meaning so she was having sex with a Jewish man. Um, there is no denying, I don't think, or it was never denied that Bloomberg, by Bloomberg, that the photos were, were of his wife and whatever. And so the Nazi hierarchy, as it says here, was growing threatened to go public um, about his war wife's knowledge well they knew about this beforehand but i think it was hitler and a few of the others attended his wedding so they initially approved or publicly were involved with this wedding but i think this was a chumped up charge now with fritch was there was a different army officer with a um, similar name that did have um real allegations or or was arrested for homosexual activity um not arrested for being a homosexual to my understanding, but like um, hiring male prostitutes or something. I don't know. But it was a different um, person. But Heydrich is it's a prepared a file on Fritsch. So, and I'm not really sure, again, you, as you know, loyal viewers, I'm not great on all the, the details of order, which one they got rid of first, because these are not quite simultaneous, but going on and prepared. So what they do is they discredit um, Fritsch for, have, for having an arrest record involving homosexuality. It's different than, you know, oh, I was drunk in a, in a um, beer house fight, and, you know, or brawl or big brawl and got arrested for, for you know, um, slugging somebody in public during it. Probably a German officer could survive that um, if, you know, if he got some, you know, it depends on what sort of you're, you're arrested for. If you're arrested for, for stealing money in the public trust, you're going to be, you're going to, um, uh, you know, it depends, you know, it depends on the arrest, but, but this credits him so that to get him out of the way, because if you don't have him as a, there isn't otherwise very clear, um, successor to Bloomberg. And so what this allows to do is that you get rid of Bloomberg. You officially at this time, put Hitler in charge of the army. He becomes the equivalent of the minister of war. Um, because Fritsch isn't there to take it over. There is some, was it Hadler or, or somebody else um, was disliked by some other clique or whatever and to, to elevate him to the to the position was thought too much, though I think sort of Hadler does sort of functionally take over. If one of you guys want to correct it down below, you can. Um, take over the role of, of head of the um, sort of ministry, if you will, under Hitler. But So this is the last real... Um, getting rid of, as Hitler saw it, any real threats from the army to his plans. And I know we went very long on this episode, but um, I think some important things to talk about. So this is sort of it. This is the tipping point. If the um, Bloomberg could have could have gone, oh, I'm not, re I'm not resigning. Yeah, publish the photos. I don't know what the photos would have looked like. Again, they could have been really shocking. Or they could have just been, oh, oh she's naked. She was young, hungry, and need, needed work. You know, I don't know. Um, so this is something that, you know, I think he, I think he could have withstand, but it would have put a um, black mark on the German military high command, and he might have lost some support. But yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's Bloomberg. That's Fritsch. Pretty sure that's Bloomberg. Yeah, it's Bloomberg. And of course, that's von Rundstedt. I'm much more used to seeing photos of von Rundstedt. So, we can reform the army with more loyalists. Bloomberg, Fritsch, and will be removed. And Brauhitsch will become chief of the army. Maybe it's Brauhitsch that was thinking instead of Hadler. But, or we can keep them. Um, we don't use them as... Um, the leaders, yeah, they're useful, but they're not that good. And the leaders we don't use really. So we're going to go with that and we will gain some dissent, but I'm, we're going to go with the historical. So, um, we've no, we've lost the, 
Munich thing because we now have um, more dissent, but we also have time for the Bank for International Settlement. So, yes, we want the biggest support there. Okay, well, we're going to end the episode there. I hope, even for the long episode, it was worth it. Um, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for liking the videos. I really do appreciate it. And, of course, I really appreciate any of you making any comments. Um, I really do appreciate that. And, of course, please spread the word about the channel. I would really love to grow it. Thanks so much. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.